Good morning. All right, we are in Acts today, chapter 4, verses 13 through 22. Let's pray. God in heaven, <clears throat> God, bring us to a place today, a place of humility before your scripture. Remind us of our dependence on you in everything. God, everything from our daily bread to our righteousness, to the strength uh, that you give us to complete the works that you've prepared for us. Everything in our lives is complete and utter dependence on you, whether we realize it or not, God. So please um, make us teachable. Help us to learn that today in your scripture. Help us to take your word and through the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit, apply it to our hearts. We pray for sanctification, changing. Make us more like your son, Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, we are again in chapter 4 uh, of Acts, verses twelve through uh, 13 through 22. Let's go ahead and read. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. <clears throat> but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, his, in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. God's word to us today in Acts. <clears throat> Again, we see Peter and John knocking it out of the park. And again, not in their power. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. All right, let's observe. So the leaders see Peter and John's boldness, and um, they're amazed. They know the two of them have been with Jesus, but can't refute them because the healed man's standing right in front of them. They, um, they talk in private, and they decide that since they can't deny the truth, they would order Peter and John to not tell people the truth. Peter and John said that they have to tell people what they have seen and heard. So the leaders threaten Peter and John, but can't punish them because the people are praising God for what had happened. All right. Uh, again, Peter and John are in a situation where they're relying completely on the Holy Spirit for this. As we talked about um, previously, um, this is an amazing God-sized change in their lives. And for the elders and priests, scribes, the leaders, this is really just a revealing of the character that they've had. So what, what's happening here is that the elders and priests, um, they face a crucial decision. Are, well, we know they're not stupid. They're not stupid men. They are able to reason. But the decision they're about to make is going to show them to be fools, not wise. And there is a distinction between being um, smart and being wise, being stupid and being foolish. You can be smart and foolish, and you can be stupid and wise. It depends on where you're placing your trust and 
and your willingness to align yourself with God's truth. Even a person who is not the smartest can, through God's grace, align themselves with his truth and be shown wise. So that's where these elders and priests are. They're having to make this decision. What are we going to do? And of course, they're not framing it in that way necessarily. They're thinking, um, I need to keep my power. I need to keep my possessions. I need to keep this. That We need to hold this together. I think that's probably their motivation. They're fearing things other than God. <clears throat> but they see, as it tells us, that, that Peter and John, um, that they've changed. Because these are, they, see, they see they're common men. They're not educated. Yet they're speaking with boldness and authority. So they, they perceive, and it says, they recognize that they had been with Jesus. And, and so what's happening here is that they, again, this is being associated with Jesus. So they want to, they want to oppose these two men because they oppose Jesus. And we should expect nothing less in our lives. If, if we are on the side of Christ, we should expect opposition. That's what the world does. It, it opposes Christ. Um, anyway, so, so they, they know that they, these two have been with Jesus. And they, they know that scribes and elders know what Jesus had been teaching. And part of the... It, Christ's teaching was these seven woes. If you remember from Matthew 23, the seven woes to the scribes and Pharisees. Calling them out in their hypocrisy and sin. And so they're opposing Christ. They're opposing reality. They're opposing truth. Um, except that they can't. It says... But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Because what can they say? The, the proof of the power of their message is standing right in front of them. There's nothing they can say. But they're still unwilling to accept. They're caught in a trap. And it's a trap of their own making. And it's a trap that all of us fall into when we oppose the truth we find ourselves in an untenable position where we have to deny reality, which means to hold together the little world we've created, we have to lie. And we have to suppress the truth and create a lie. And we have to keep telling ourselves and the people around us a lie. And that's exactly what they're doing here. The elders and scribes are, and the priests, are trying to suppress the truth that Peter and John have told. I mean, and, and let's be honest, this is a losing battle already for them. 5,000 people, right? 5,000 people have been converted already <laughs> just yesterday to them. But anyway, but they're so desperate to hold on to their little manufactured world that they're going to ignore the truth, suppress the truth, and continue to tell the lie that Christ was not the Messiah. In fact, they would be happy if the name of Christ just disappeared from the face of the earth. Um, yeah, so instead of submitting to the truth, they fight it. They can't say anything in opposition, but still they oppose it. And they oppose it with their actions, even though they can't oppose it with their words. At least at this point, they've got enough intellectual honesty to do that. But you know when they leave, they'll oppose the truth with their words. But they're smart enough to not do it as the truth is staring in the, them in the face. Um, and they're not stupid, but they're making themselves out to be fools here. They're showing themselves to be fools. And I, do, I don't think, I doubt that every single one of them is of the exact same mind. And, and the reason I think that, it's, it doesn't say that here. So this is not necessarily... Uh, from the canon of Scripture, but we know what they talked about. How, how do we know what they talked about? My guess would be, and again, I don't know if it says this anywhere in the Bible, I've never seen this, but my guess would be that at least one of these elders or one of these priests saw the truth and submitted to the truth, 
sat through the meeting, heard what was going on, and said, This is not okay. This is not right. And left. God softened that man's heart, and he was converted. And then later he probably told them what they said in the meeting. Oh, by the way, Peter and John, this is what they said about you guys in the meeting. The meeting where they asked you to leave, and then they talked. This is what they said. That's just my hunch. I mean, let's call it an educated guess. Um, so, um, again, we see that just the fact that they had been with Jesus made the elders and scribes want to oppose Peter and John. And I, it's interesting, there's, there's four buts in this passage. And they're big buts. <laughs> They're um, important buts um, because it shows a twisting, a changing, an opposition in each but. The word but in, in and of itself is an, op an opposition word, right? But, but, but this is opposition. And so we see four oppositions in this passage. The first but is, um, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. So the first but is them realizing that reality, or we could say truth, opposes their view of what's happening. They want to oppose Christ, but the power of Christ to heal a person is staring them in the face. So that's this first but. Reality is opposing these elders and scribes and, and leaders. Okay, Reality is opposing them. That's the first but. The second but. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but in order that it may spread no further... Oh, let's stop there. And we cannot deny it. So the second but is them acknowledging that reality opposes them, acknowledging that opposition. They see this opposition. They see... Okay, we are, essentially, if they were more honest, they'd be saying, we are wrong. That's what they're what basically saying here. Everyone knows a miracle has been performed, and we can't oppose it, even though we want to. So they're acknowledging that reality opposes them and their viewpoint. And then there's the third but. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in, in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So that's the third but, the third opposition. And this is where the scribes, leaders, elders, they actually decide they're going to oppose reality. They're going to oppose the truth. They're going to oppose God. Because let's think about this. If, if this miracle, which could only have been worked by God, happened in the name of Jesus, it means Jesus is was sent by God, and they were wrong all along. So they're choosing to oppose God, who is truth, who is reality. So that's the third but. They are deciding to oppose the truth. <clears throat> and then the fourth but. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So the fourth but is Peter and John opposing them because they oppose the truth. So they're taking the side of the truth. And he calls them out again. This, this perceptiveness, this insight that Peter has as he speaks with them, being able to cut right to the heart of the matter, has to have come from the Holy Spirit because this is the same Peter that could not perceive pretty much anything that Christ was teaching them, except when, you know, he, he acknowledged Christ as God, Jesus as God, and he said, you got that from God. So this is the Holy Spirit giving Peter wisdom, knowledge. And he calls them out. He says, whether it's right in the sight of God, in the sight of God, you better think carefully, you guys, you're in the sight of God, whether it's right in the sight of God, to listen to you rather than to God, so he's boiling down this whole argument. You're opposing the truth. God has made this happen. 
So you're opposing God, right? So am I going, are we going to listen to you or are we going to listen to God? He's, he's boiled the whole thing down to this one sentence, which is so brilliant. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. He's saying you'll make your decision for yourself. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So he's saying, but we're not going to oppose the truth. And I can, I can imagine this group he's talking to just thinking, why can't these people just go away? Just go away so we can, we can start pretending to be righteous again. Why can't they just be quiet? They would have done anything to keep them quiet. They threatened them with violence. They tried to reason them into, into quietness. But Peter and John are having none of it. The truth will be known. And in all of this, these leaders, these elders, these priests are confirming if more confirmation was even necessary, the seven woes that Christ spoke to them in Matthew 23. When he says, and I'll just read a little bit, right? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in, our, in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Christ is calling them out ahead of time for the fact that they're going to kill him, the ultimate prophet. Or earlier when he says, So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And what is lawlessness? Opposing God's law, opposing God's truth. And that's what they're doing here. And they are proving Christ's words right and true as they are fighting the truth of Christ. Another great irony. <laughs> we need to be careful that we don't find ourselves in that same place. The same place that these scribes, Pharisees, elders, rulers find themselves. And they're meeting together saying, you know, we got to do something about this, Peter. Yeah, we, we need to do something about him. He's a problem. We're going to have to take care of him. But what, but what? That's the question. If, if you were sitting there with the elders and scribes, priests, etc., you probably would have seen Peter as arrogant, self-righteous, because he's attacking your righteousness, which is actually the self-righteousness. And Christ had called them out on that. Th there's this place where we find ourselves when we oppose the truth, as these men are doing, where we get ourselves so tangled up in our own ridiculous plans and schemes that we start to think God's, God's word is just so confusing and it could be interpreted so many different ways. This is just as good as any other way. And so you actually end up opposing the truth, saying that there is some kind of unknowable mystery to, to God's law. And while there are unknowable mysteries concerning God, and they are wondrous mysteries, God's commands to us are not confusing. And in fact, that's, that's my takeaway for the day. God's commands and truth are not ambiguous or confusing. It is our refusal to obey and accept them that makes us confused. We must all judge whether it is right to listen to men or to God. Who will you listen to, men or God? To scripture? Will you fear the Lord or will you fear men? These men putting Peter and John on trial are fearing people. They're fearing circumstances. They're, they're afraid to do anything because of the people. And the people are, are praising God. So they're actually fearing people praising God and God's wondrous works. This is how upside down they've gotten themselves. 
But Peter and John are fearing the Lord, therefore they are speaking the truth with boldness. Okay. I've, I've gone uh, long enough on this, I think. Hopefully we all get the idea. Hopefully we can all submit. We can, we can find our hearts softened by God and hear his truth and, and find ourselves changed. That's what I pray for myself. That's what I pray for you. Let's pray together. God Almighty, God, change us, please. Take our stony, pathetic, weak hearts and make them soft, ready for your word, and strong. Give us boldness to speak your truth and give us the fear of you that causes us to submit to your word and be changed by it. We know that none of it is possible without you. If we say it's from ourselves, we are fooling ourselves in the worst possible way. So we admit our need for you, and we admit the fact that we do not even have any idea how much we really do need you, but we're willing to learn, God. We love you. We love your son, Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, everyone, have a great day. I'll see you again.